Hello, everybody. My name is Jamie. I'm the studio coordinator in the woodworking studio here. Um, welcome, everybody, to Anderson Ranch. Excited to have you all here. Um, before we get going tonight, if everyone could take a moment to silence your cell phones real quick. And while you're doing that, um, Anderson Ranch would like to acknowledge that our campus resides on th the traditional ancestral territory of the Ute people who called the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond home for over 800 years. Tonight's program will consist of two faculty lectures followed by a quick Q&A. Um, and one last thing before we get going, I just want to remind everyone that we are all going to meet here at 845 tomorrow for a general orientation before we go to our individual studios. All right. First up, I'd like to introduce Rafael Fajardo. Was that a hard enough D? That was great. Thanks. <laughs> Rafael Fajardo is an artist and collaborator based in Denver, Colorado, and teaches at the University of Denver in the Emergent Digital Practices Program. Rafael investigates cultural identity and cultural representation through his visual and intellectual work. His early explorations, completed while receiving his MFA from RISD, garnered recognition from the American Center for Design. More recently, his critical practice has earned him recognition by ID, the International Magazine of Design, as one of the 50 top designers in the US. He's part of an emerging group of artists and designers who are exploring the potential of digital video games to express serious and complex subject matter. Through his collaborative, Sweat, Raphael has published two video games that comment on the game-like nature of illegal human trafficking at the U.S.-Mexico border. These games have been exhibited in Holland, Turkey, Canada, Australia, and the U.S. Raphael was also awarded a grant by the Colorado Council for the Arts to support scholarships for underrepresented populations to attend a game camp he is organizing with the Department of Computer Science at the University of Denver. Please join me in welcoming Raphael. Hello, y'all. Thank you for having me here. I'm going to turn a uh, timer on so that I don't ramble on more than 20 minutes. And go and bring up my notes so I remember what order I put the slides in. All right. Um, the, um, I was, my original training is as a graphic designer, uh, but even before then, I was a very digital boy. I, um, as a child of immigrants, my parents, my father in particular, gave me three choices. College was not a choice. It was not optional. It had to, it was required. But I could either go into medicine, go into law, or like him, become an engineer. Um, I um, was digital and technical at a very young age, uh, but at, ten, at the age of 10, I knew I wanted to be an artist. And um, so I did what a dutiful son would do and went to school and started off as an electrical engineering major and got a lot of Fs and nearly failed out of the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, changed my major to computer science uh, for about a year and didn't do very much better. I'd, I had already learned how to program computers, and, but they, I did not want to calculate um, compound interest rates through computation. I wanted to make pictures that moved on the screen. Um, and nobody was teaching that. Um, and so I started taking life drawing classes to keep myself sane and uh, ended up doing really, really, really well. And um, so I um, have a lot of Fs on my transcript, my permanent record, and uh, did my undergraduate degree in seven years, not four, um, and um, then went on to grad school and did some more graphic design that way and um, learned how to um, make websites uh, right at the dawn of the dot-com bubble. And uh, it, being able to make websites is truly powerful. It is a, if effectively a printing press that is, has global reach. And I wanted to have that, I wanted to seize the means of production. And I wanted to share the means of production with my students. And um, at some point when e-commerce became a thing, it became too boring to do websites because I felt like I was making elevator buttons in a shopping mall. And so I wanted more from uh, digital electronic interaction uh, with m more emotional content and more potential uh, to reach someone's heart. And so I had this sort of 
duh moment. It's like, oh, video games do that. Uh, so I tried to figure out how to make video games. Um, and I was kind of, um, um, uh, kind of, I will say, um, I waited until the right tool came along. Uh, a tool that would respect my ability to draw first and then code sort of second. And um, I taught myself how to use it. It came out in uh, around 1998. Uh, uh, it no longer exists, so that causes some problems. But I was at that point in time, I was teaching at the University of Texas in El Paso, and um, half of my students every day would migrate across the U.S.-Mexico border to come to class. And um, I improved my Spanish. As a child of immigrants, my parents wanted me to learn English exquisitely, and so forgive me if I stumble in my second language. Um, I almost lost my first one. And um, I took the advantage of explaining myself in English in the classroom and then explaining myself again in Spanish so that my students who crossed the border would have the same opportunities that my English-speaking students would have. Um, and they, in turn, taught me a lot. Um, and so I, um, you know, I had taught them how to make websites and then I was teaching myself how to make video games in this really, really eccentric programming environment that was designed for 10 year olds. But it was super powerful. It was like the most powerful box of crayons I'd ever seen. And I tried to convince my students that they really needed to get on board with this, but it looked too cute. Uh, and so I convinced them that Kawaii was the future. Uh, <laughs> cute is the way to go. And uh, no, we did not want to learn 3D modeling. We actually wanted to stay in two dimensions and, uh, and use a very limited color palette, um, even as everybody else was barreling toward uh, VR. And they're still trying to make VR a thing. Um, and we asked the question, can video games contain and express non-entertainment subject matter and still be entertaining? Can they? take on heavy duty subject matter. Um, part of my lived experience there was to observe that crossing the US-Mexico border sometimes felt like the game Frogger. And so I started to sketch out, this is a, the one on the, sorry, your left is a game design document, all of one page, it's a sketch for a very simple video game that became a game, a, a game we call Crosser and it is based on the gameplay of Frogger. And um, my grad students and I, uh, I asked them, they had finished all of the subject matter, uh, the content of the design class I was teaching like six weeks early. And I said, would you all like to learn how to make a video game together? And they said, yeah. So uh, my first collaborative was born, Sweat was born, the Southwest Ensemble for Art and Technology. Uh, uh, myself and six graduate students trying to make this video game together that modeled um, what it might be like to cross the U.S.-Mexico border. And um, as, we, as was mentioned in the, the, um, my bio that Jamie introduced me with, uh, the games have gone on to be shown, but at, in, 19, in, in the year 2000 when we made them, it was radically weird. Um, and I, I couldn't get them shown. So here is from 2018 where um, we have them installed in an honest to goodness gallery um, and uh, people engaging with the work and, and it, it's fantastic. But I, I wanna share with you a, a very quick 30 second video of the gameplay. Um, it's, it's kind of a challenge to, to share the gameplay here live. So um, you play as Carlos Moreno, who's you start at the bottom of the screen on the Ciudad Juarez side and you attempt to cross the Rio Grande and you attempt to cross IH-10 and you try to reach the visa. Um, if you touch anything, you get sent back. Um, I think that I recorded this one as a successful gameplay, um, but it, it's, not, it's really not an easy game to play. And I can share with you all uh, an online version if, you, if you're curious. Um, and so, and so, <laughs> And then um, a year later, so you know, try, that was the one that we finished first and we actually we put it on the World Wide Web. We took advantage of that, um, the, the printing press. And it, so it went out to the world, uh, but we couldn't get it shown in El Paso. Um, 
and it couldn't really get shown until around 2002 after I had moved to Denver. And in the meantime, I made another game that made the story much more complicated, right? So it was complicated enough to put the player in the shoes of trying to help someone across the US-Mexico border and have them actually ask questions. And we have a very dark sense of humor while we were doing this. We were, um, we were willing to laugh at ourselves, and, 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 but also laugh, at, at, uh, laugh because otherwise we would cry. And so the, the dark sense of humor, the gallows sense of humor was something that we were honoring while we were doing this. We think of the games as satire at this point. Um, and so I thought that the satire was a little bit flat and needed another dimension. And so I made a game that puts the player in the shoes of a border patrol agent in a state-of-the-art Ford Explorer um, during um, Operation Hold the Line uh, that stationed a Ford Explorer every quarter of a mile along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and um, keep an eye, I should have, uh, the, there's basically you fling handcuffs and once you uh, capture somebody, they dutifully will go over to the right and then down to the deportation center and then they will be repatriated at the top. Um, this, this one was inspired by Space Invaders, but is not a slavish um, reenactment as, as uh, oh shoot, sorry, as um, uh, Frogger was and Crosser was. Um, and so they, we, we honored that, that the people who might cross have their own agendas and they don't necessarily stay. At least that was the lived reality at the time. Um, people in Juarez use the river for a number of reasons. Uh, and on the US side, we have made the banks extremely dangerous. Um, and, um, and so it, it, it's just a really, really strange dynamic. And then, yeah, it, how the, the game player might feel conflicted because if they play to win, then um, they get to keep their job, but if they play with a conscience and enable people to cross, they lose their job. And so these two outcomes are, and, and there's, something, it, there's something very special about the moment when the player experiences that reveal. Um, that I, you know, it's, uh, I hesitate often sharing it in public because the, um, that, that emotion that you feel is the thing that as a game designer we were after. It is how, do, how does the player experience an emotional register and, and what is that emotional register and how does one calibrate it? So there's, there's the component that's sort of the, can we make something that's delightful and cute visually, but how does the emotional part get communicated? Um, after coming to, the, uh, to Denver where I teach now and have lived for the last 20 years, um, I went on and made a few video games um, that were less about the U.S.-Mexico border and more about the war on drugs. Um, I am a Colombian. My parents migrated from, from Colombia. And so um, our policies with respect to drug interdiction uh, affected my family. Um, Pablo Escobar affected my family. Um, my cousins uh, were sent to school for a couple of years with us in San Antonio, Texas to escape threats by Pablo Escobar to the families of their classmates. Um, and so I wanted to try and explore what the war on drugs, were, it could, how could one do this through video game? This is a very weird one called So Reap, and it's a very large one, and I'll try to uh, give you a kind of a, a, a background behind it. So um, the hardware is, pretty intense. Um, each playground has a projector, a CPU or a computer, and a connect sensor. And um, the player, you can learn how to play it in 30 seconds. Your body is the interface. You stand in front of the play screen and you strike a pose. If you strike, and if you strike a pose and you're standing close to this play screen, you plant a poppy and a poppy grows, and it's a beautiful, beautiful flower. And if you stand further away from the screen and you strike the same pose, you cut down flowers. And so you, it creates a, a space, there's, there's no real victory condition in this game. We're, so we're exploring the boundaries of what it does, what it is to be a game. But it did make a kind of a playground in which 
people could play against one another. One could choose to grow poppies, and here the poppies are the metaphor for a drug crop. Um, and, and you know, Pablo Escobar's time was famous for cocaine, but my mom witnessed poppies being grown and the vertical integration that Pablo Escobar did um, from a sort of business jargon sense. Like they, you could grow poppies, process the opium, and distribute all from Colombia in the same way that they could do cocaine in the same way they could do marijuana. Um, and so we chose poppies because the, the cocaine plant is green and green on green. There was, it was a visual aesthetic decision. It was beautiful poppies putting flowers into the world. And so you can approach this with a very innocent um, uh, uh, mindset. Um, but you can also approach it with this other layer of meaningfulness. And then I, just to give you, uh, we play tested it in a different configuration. Uh, and And that's all it took to learn how to play. And we had planned to try to submit this to the Denver Art Museum in a special gallery space that they had. Um, they, they were scared of the amount of hardware that it required. Closer to the screen? Yeah, that's um, And so, um, you know, trying to make large, immersive, ambitious games that involve the human body as the um, as the controller uh, with the goal of making it easy to learn so that more audiences and non-traditional audiences or non-game playing audiences can find their way to the material was important to us and remains important to us. Um, and this is a dr preliminary drawing for um, a game from 2018 called Migraciones. I was asked to and invited to um, make a video game that would commemorate and comment upon the 300th anniversary of the founding of San Antonio, Texas. That's where I was raised after my parents were migra uh, migrated to the US. And it was a deep honor to be, um, uh, to, to be part of that commemoration. Now, I could not think of it as a, uh, in honoring any of the colonial era, um, I mean, the, the, the founding of San Antonio, Texas is the founding of San Antonio de Valero, what we call, colloquially know of as the Alamo, right? So it was a celebration of the Spanish colonial program, and it's not right in my mind to make that celebration. Uh, instead, uh, I honored migration of human peoples. Uh, San Antonio is on the monarch butterfly migration path, and um, they would alight on a mesquite tree in my family's backyard. And so I, and they had this really radically horizontal bow. And I, so I drew in what would be a very simple gesture. It's like, okay, the player doesn't know they're playing. When no one's around, butterflies come and alight on the bow of the tree. But when somebody approaches the tr the, to have a better look at the butterflies, they fly away. And so this is the game, a very, very minimalist gesture. I had such insecurity about it. Uh, and then I shared it with a couple of my collaborators and said, no, no, it's it. I said, oh, okay. It's just deeply insecure and okay. Um, this is a minute long video that shows the finished product and, um, and uh, uh, an installation. So uh, the, um, and this one, I, I I prototyped it in Scratch, which is what I will be teaching the young people. And then uh, my older son um, wanted to collaborate with me, and he's in the industry now, and he 3D modeled and wrote the first draft of the program. And uh, my other collaborator, Chris Gautedicki, is the head of computer science at the University of Denver, and he was born in Laredo, and this was deeply meaningful for him too, and, and Chris just made it better. Um, and so, yeah, when the, the butterflies fly away, that's because someone has frightened them. About two minutes left. So about... Okay. All right. And so, yeah, the, um, the player doesn't necessarily know that they are actually an influence on the system, uh, on the nature that we are presenting. Um, and so with my final couple of minutes, 
Um, I'm revisiting a, another very old game, uh, again using Scratch, because I, the games don't always, uh, the, I've had to rewrite Crosser and La Migra three times now so that people can continue to play them and so that they have an opportunity to be put into the world. Um, I just came from opening uh, at the Southern Utah Museum of Art where they're on exhibition until September. Um, and then they're also in a show that's gonna open in Minneapolis um, July 1st and it will also be through the mid end of September. This one hasn't been shown, well it's one that was shown in a festival in, in Turkey. Um, you play as Juan Valdez, the uh, the representative of Colombian coffee. And uh, I'm rebuilding the game, so this one also had poppies in it. Um, and it, Juan is equipped with a machete and attempts to cut down all of the poppies. And in the original, um, it's very, very difficult because the butterflies help pollinate and propagate the poppies. Um, and um, and so this, this is a work in progress of me testing the game systems in uh, a new um, game making platform, a new quirky game programming environment. And it's the one that I will teach in uh, to the kids because it's easy to learn. Um, and so this is, uh, it's like, oh, it's old work, but it's new work at the same time. And so that's, that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. And, and, Thank you, Raphael. That was fantastic. Um, next up in the Wood Studio this week is Aspen Golan. Um, Aspen is an artist and furniture maker, blending early American furniture forms with sculpture and social practice. Aspen trained as a 17th to 19th century woodworker at the North Bennett Street School in Boston and has worked within the medium of reproducing early American furniture forms to illustrate the racial, gender, and social injustices endemic to that time, as well as those injustices of the current age. Aspen's work has been exhibited nationally, and she's been published in American Craft, Fine Woodworking Magazine, and Architectural Digest, among many others. She serves on the board of the Furniture Society, the Society of Arts and Crafts, and a workshop of our own, a wood shop in Baltimore aims to promote the careers of women and gender non-conforming craftspeople in our field. In 2020, Aspen founded the Chairmaker's Toolbox, a project that provides free tools, education, and mentorship for BIPOC, gender expansive, and female chair and tool makers seeking to build sustainable businesses. She has received support from her work from the Wingate Foundation, United Artists, Winter Thermal Museum, Anderson Ranch, and the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship, and was awarded the Minnick Furniture Fellowship in 2020 and the Maxwell Hanrahan Foundation Award in Craft earlier this year. Um, Aspen's doing really awesome things in our fields, and I'm very excited to finally meet her. So please welcome Aspen. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me? Enjoy the most glamorous photo of me ever taken. <laughs> this is so glamorous. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pull up my slides. I woke up um, at 2 in the morning, so pardon me. All right. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's uh, just, it's like an honor to be here. Um, I want to thank my amazing friend Colin um, for being here to assist and the awesome people who have chosen to spend two weeks with me making chairs here. Um, and for all of you for choosing to sit here and listen right now. Um, so yeah, my name's Aspen Golan. Um, I'm also on my tippy toes right now. I'm just, let's just be real <laughs> down here. <laughs> um, I'm a woodworker, um, teacher, like broom brush maker. Um, and I didn't get into woodworking until I was relatively old. I got, I started when I was 29, thir like about like a month before I turned 30. Um, but I was always really obsessed with making things from scratch. Um, and I think that that spirit still underlies a lot of the work that I make. And I think that it used to be maybe even more pathological than it is now um, in that I think this is a good example. Weaving was the first craft that I learned or taught myself. And it just made sense to me that the way that I would start learning to weave was um, by buying a sheep. <laughs> so, oh wait, 
I need to see. There she is. <laughs> so um, that's Liesl up in the front. Um, the other sheep is a friend of hers who photobombed. Um, but I, I learned a lot, like, with and from Liesl, like, the processes of dyeing wool, um, spinning, weaving. Um, we did these, these projects where we would go she and I to people's properties and we would forage for dye plants and then we would I would shear her and we would make these blankets that are like these place-based portraits of you know their landscape and um, again if we're talking about obsessive from scratch things I still make things obsessively from scratch but now it's like basically furniture all the time so um, this is a Windsor chair or a Windsor settee which is like a great example of making things obsessively from scratch um, in that it's like basically split out of a single log that you harvest on you know in this case a friend of mine's property um, my friend Pete and I shaped and turned and carved and made the whole thing like by hand, there's no power tools um, in Windsor chair making as well. So um, yeah, it's just a really wild process. Um, this is, I put some pictures of the, of the process that we're gonna go through. So there's a lot of splitting, um, there's like shaving and shaping, there's um, carving, there's bending, there's compound angle drilling, there's joining. Um, and all of those things come together to make these really elegant and like beautiful surfaces that are also totally vernacular furniture. Like they can be made by anyone, anywhere, um, which is another thing I love about it because furniture is relatively inaccessible um, form a lot of the time. So I do a lot of carving and I, you know, make things that are typically uh, like very ornamented and like really visually overwhelming. Um, <laughs> I learned to be a furniture maker at North Bennett Street School. So like it's as old school as stuff gets. So like, this is the kind of work that I was making there. Um, and the reason I was into this stuff, I mean, it's like a million brass pins and like a bunch of leaves and just, I mean, just ridiculous furniture that there's no place for in this world at this point, nor should there be. Um, but I was really into it because I think that like, I wasn't, okay, so I wasn't interested in period forms or, you know, or history even particularly. What I saw when I looked at this kind of work was like just a bunch of skills, right? Like this, that I could collage together and use any way that I wanted. So it was like all of these weird little brush strokes. And I'm like, man, if I could figure out how to make a curve like that, if I could figure out how to do an inlay like that, I could do anything that I wanted. Um, and <laughs> this piece is really uh, particularly funny to me in that it's, one of those things that I would have thought was so horrifically ugly before I went to North Bennett Street School and like just drank the period furniture Kool-Aid for a while. But then you get into it and you start, like I think this, this piece, like it really represents this kind of um, break, mental break for me where I both fell in love with period furniture and decided that I needed like a big, I needed a break from it. Um, so it's like, it's so flamboyant. It's so like horrific in a lot of ways, but I also think that there's something really like sort of loving and elegant and like about its chunkiness and the fact that these pieces were made for houses that didn't have a lot of light, you know, so you had to have these really dramatic forms in order for to be able to see after you come back in from working all day and you're in a space, you know, so you have to think about furniture like emerging from the environment in which it lives, which is also cool. But um, this also like, I don't know, who makes furniture here? Does anyone make furniture? Yeah, it's terrible. So it like, you'll have an idea and it'll be months sometimes before you even see that thing, before you're putting finish on it or even like really seeing its form. And so I had basically like, I just needed a stress release. And so one day I was walking home from North Bennett and I found um, an airbrush on the side of the road and I picked it up and I just started making these like huge airbrush paintings that meant nothing and I showed them to no one. Um, but they were like still referencing furniture and I was sort of starting to play with the relationship between furniture and the body. Um, yeah, <laughs> I like this one. Um, yeah, and I think that like the ability to like act in this really like sort of loose, weird way, um, it freed me up and it created a sense of play in my practice again that I really desperately, desperately needed. Um, and then that airbrushing led back to wood. And so this is a um, little like sand shading and marquetry thing, which is essentially where you like cut up really thin veneers and then you burn the edges of the wood in hot sand in order to create shading. And so, yeah, it started as pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, 
basically like you can see there. So basically my point is like that play ended up becoming this really important part of my practice and recognizing that like play and silliness essentially created the space for me to learn things, right? And like it, it preceded these huge breakthroughs in my practice. So then I took that back to furniture and like this, again, playing with the relationship between furniture and the body and like imagery. And so thinking about like due to the placement of this face in the chair back, it starts to like give the chair back the um, physical characteristics of a person, like conflating the chair back and the back of the, you get it. <laughs> um, so I began to, instead of just making these traditional pieces, like mess with them as I was making them. Um, and it was really because I was sort of becoming aware of these like two things at the same time. One was that the field that I was in was so incredibly homogenous that I was basically terrified that I wasn't gonna be able to have a future in it, even if I was lucky enough to figure out how to make a chair, figure out how to you know sell one every once in a while, and that it just wouldn't be a sustainable experience like being a, a queer woman in a space like that. And so, and then the other one is sort of thinking about the social context of this furniture and wondering like, can you remove a beautiful thing from the culture that invented it? No, you know, so like, can you, in, can you make, you know, shared inside chairs and not think about the um, like racism, misogyny that existed at the time? No. Um, so that's, my answer is no. Um, so <laughs> this is just like a really, really good meme that I think really captures it. Um, so yeah, I really, I believe that all objects and their aesthetics are products of the culture that produced them. Um, and so that becomes a really important part of how you engage with the work. So like ultimately, I think I realized maybe like two semesters into my experience at North Bennett that I was sort of being trained in this aesthetic language of like white colonial power. Um, but at the same time, realizing that you can use whatever language you're capable of speaking to say whatever you want, right? So then I can use that language to tell like vulnerable stories about like femininity and descent and, um, you know, basically using the styles without repeating histories of like colonization and domination. So um, this is a, this is a clock that I basically made using these sort of iconic markers of American craft, like the ornate carving and the inlays and the glass enameling. Um, but then blending it so essentially this clock formally is totally traditional however that um, enameled panel down there and you're seeing again like these weird styles that just start to evolve in a person's practice once you start to speak them so that's that's essentially airbrushing enamel paint so um, taking crushed glass pigmented crushed glass and blowing it onto a sheet of glass and then firing it so that it vitrifies and like turns into a single physical object um, that can't be scratched or changed. But yeah, so the idea here is sort of like blend um, design details and construction methods that are historically accurate, like with and using the visual language of American supremacy to talk about myself. Um, so here you can see that this sort of the hand enameled glass panel, it really, it depicts the lower half of this formally dressed woman and the clock face replaces her face and the pleats of her dress sort of blend with the rosewood of the clock door, creating this, you know, seamless conversation between something that is both a subject and an object and like a portrait and a bit of a little prisoner. And there's the glass enameling, the enameling has this really cool transparent quality. Um, so this cabinet like similarly blurs that line between figure and furniture and the positioning of the female bodies in that like loose cloth um, transform the act of opening the doors into this like disrobing. So just by using the cabinet like you're supposed to, the user kind of violates that like internal space of these um, people. And then if you're a real nerd, <laughs> you will recognize that um, the like cabinet, the, the like cloth that I was using was sort of referencing the obviously the um, Samuel McIntyre carvings where he uses, uses these like catenary curves. Um, but there you can see it. So just like picking up on all of these different little languages and then, you know, basically internalizing them, learning them and then like wielding them in any way that I wanted. It felt amazing. Um, this is another piece. A, a lot of my larger pieces talk about like female experience specifically by talking about all the ways that furniture fulfills these really stereotypical female gender roles. Like furniture welcomes, it hosts, it bears weight, it is seen and not heard, right? Its sphere is domestic, its power is beauty, <laughs> and its labor is invisible. So um, this particular piece, I mean, I bet a lot of people have seen this style of painting in like thrift stores or at their grandparents' house. 
Yeah, like the gold on black, like it's called um, Hitchcock painting. And so I was doing this thing where I was riffing off of all of the traditional like fruit and garden motifs that you would see, but then also sort of starting to blend in my own work. And um, I guess, do you want to know a little bit about Arabax tattoos from the 1700s? You can say no. <laughs> um, but basically, okay, so here's the cool thing about Arabex at Teaser in the 1700s. There's like a lot of chairs that were not made to be sat in. They're just made to sort of show off and, and be these objects that indicate hierarchy and indicate power in a house. And this type of settee is one of them. It is super uncomfortable to sit on. It's essentially just like a painting um, that sits there. And so these images that I was incorporating are sort of like simultaneously sort of acts of hospitality and acts of withholding hospitality and sort of gardening and caring for and also destroying the um, traditional motifs of the work. So yeah, there it is. Oh yeah, and then the pandemic hit and I couldn't leave my house um, and I only had little pieces of wood and so I started making brushes. Um, and so the idea with this work is basically like combining all these mediums and pushing the boundaries of functional and sculptural work. And I've really been enjoying like playing with brush and spoon forms, which I think also have really interesting ties to like domestic space and stereotypically female labor. And I also really love the <laughs> getting to use the traditional skills that I learned in fancy furniture school um, to make these objects that are associated with you know domestic labor. So I think another one of the things that I learned in the pandemic, and I think a lot of us did, is that making small work is awesome and that um, there's really no hierarchy to making, right? That like big is not better than small and serious is not better than playful and utilitarian is not better than sculptural. Um, but it took me isolating myself in order to experience that. And I think that those unspoken hierarchies have been affected in what I make for a really long time. Um, and as I've already said, like that loose playful work, that's what leads to the bigger um, bigger, yeah, this is a candelabra. Um, Carl Jung said this thing, I keep meaning to look up the actual quote, but he said this really lovely thing, and I have like a, yeah, that um, everything new emerges from the play instinct. And it's this idea that like a person, as a person who loves to practice, and I love tangible material, and I love to control things, that I also need to like invest in the chaos and sort of hyper personal part of making that is my brain, and the part that plays with the thing that it loves. So um, these are like, they have tiny nods to function, but they're, they're not, it's about materiality and play and surprise um, and me getting to finally use the skills that I learned to do whatever, whatever I want, man. Um, I also have an active teaching practice and I do it because I love it, but also because I think that after centuries of exclusion that the future of this field depends on the authentic participation of people who've been excluded from it. Um, so I formed this nonprofit called the Chairmakers Toolbox. Um, and basically, like, yeah, we, as Jamie said, provide free tools and mentorship and education um, for people who identify as underrepresented in the field. Um, and the first thing we do is we teach a lot of free classes. So if you want to make a chair, you should check out our website. Um, and the idea is like creating safe space for people to find personal voice and like engage with period furniture and chair making specifically. Um, and it's been very fun and beautiful and bountiful. Um, one of the other things, and okay, this is a question, why Windsor chairs? So like why focus on Windsor chairs for that specifically? And it's because they don't require a lot of machines or a big shop or other makers to help you. And I think one of the things that I was afraid of as, an, as someone who was feeling alienated in my field was that I would have to work in a space that was alienating. You know, I had to like go into the wood shop every Every day in order to do what I wanted to do and there were jerks there and it was challenging and so the idea that Windsor chairs can be made in your backyard is incredibly empowering also the tools last a lifetime so if you get a little kit you're like good to go um, you can also let this is a zine that I made about um, how to make chairs if you're interested I'll totally give you a free PDF of it um, but you can learn the rules really quickly and then immediately begin to use that information to make new and innovative work which is amazing Oh, do you want a one minute video of how to make a Windsor chair? Yeah. All right, don't. You're allowed to say no, but you're not. Oh wait, how do I press play on here? Just press flip forward again. Oh, hey. You got it, man. Enjoy the ASMR. <laughs> Thank you. 
You have to steam it first. <laughs> It's this quiet in my shop all the time. And it's a chair. Wow. <laughs> Stop. Next. OK. I didn't make that. <laughs> The moral of the story is you want to make Windsor chairs. You all do. Um, but I think that like the, the reason I show that video is that like the fun, flexible processes behind this like form of chair making is the reason why people keep making stuff with it. Um, look at these weirdos. I know, so good, George Sawyer. Um, yeah, who even knows what that's for? I think about this regularly. <laughs> I've never uh, resolved it in my mind. This one's really fun. Those are live flowers, so they, they're drilled out and they have little vials of water in them, so you can swap them out. It's my friend Annie, she's amazing. Um, Joyce Lynn made this really gorgeous thing. So yeah, I'm a huge proponent of this type of experimentation and that's what we're gonna be doing in class for the next two weeks. And I really believe that playing with period forms like this is the only way that you're gonna keep them alive. Um, yeah, so this is the super simple chair that I often teach um, in order to like separate the essential processes of chair making from all that flamboyant blah 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 um, so that students can essentially like learn how to do this quickly um, and start making their own stuff right away. Um, boop, boop, boop. Oh yeah, and then, okay, there's two more things that Chairmaker Solvex does, but I'm gonna talk about them really fast. Um, so the other thing is you need all these hyper-specific tools, all right, and the reality is that those tools are getting really hard to find, and the reality is that only um, as far, like pretty much it's like exclusively a cis white man's um, game to make these tools, and part of that is that it's already so hard to get into chair making that the chance that you're gonna then also get into tool making, blah, blah, blah. It's just this like rabbit hole essentially. So I did this thing where I started reaching out to all of the really skilled metal workers that I already knew um, who didn't necessarily have like a functioning business model yet but loved making things out of metal and saw, like asked if they'd be interested in producing a chair for or t a tool for Windsor chair making and they would choose a tool that they really dug and then we would partner them with the seasoned chair maker and they would just swap prototypes for like a year year um, and so we started making these tools so every tear maker needs a draw knife it's this like straight blade and you use it to shave away material and it's made by Megan Martin and Andrew Mears um, you can come play with all these tools in the woodshop by the way if you want they're all there. Um, and this one is a tenon cutter that makes the six degree like taper tenon that you need for legs and arm posts and it's made by my like dear friend Kelly um, she just launched that tool. This is a bronze infill mallet. It's so beautiful. Um, and it's heavy enough to put a chair together, but has these really soft faces so it doesn't dent the chair, um, as made by um, Eleanor Rose, who makes incredible tools, like just all kinds of incredible tools. Um, and this is a fro. You need it to split up the log, made by these two badasses, um, Mary Ellen Hitt and Rachel Kettinger. Um, and a carving ax is another tool that you need made by um, Julia Kaltoff, um, and a travisher um, made by my shop mate, actually Claire Minahan. Um, that one, you gotta come try. You're gonna like it. Um, oh yeah, Spoke Shave by David Clemens, who's a jeweler most of the time. All right, so the last little piece of the project um, is basically called The Living Tools, and it was inspired by this moment where I learned how to make chairs, didn't have any tools, had a five-year plan to buy all of them, and then um, an old guy who had worked for, or who had taken a class with my mentor called him and said, I'm going into hospice, I have tools, do you know anyone who would use them? And he yelled across the shop to me, and he's like, yo, you want some tools? And I'm like, yes. Um, and then two days later, the tools arrived in this box, and it was not just tools, it's like the, the perfect version of every tool that you would need to make a chair. And I just, like, you know, it, it changed my life completely, and I just lost my mind, and I started snot crying everywhere. Um, and like immediately in that moment too, it was like, I can't ever sell these. Like I'm gonna give these away in the same way that they were given to me. And so we've been collecting tools um, for the last three years and giving them to people with the one requirement that they never sell them, they give them away. To just 
perpetuate that generosity. Um, yeah, check it out. Come make a chair with us. And that's me. I, yeah. <laughs> if you're good at turning, you don't get shavings all over yourself, but I still do. All right. I'm so excited to meet you all and hang out. Huh? Oh, God. Okay. Hello again. We're going to do some Q&A. If anyone has any questions to ask either of these folks, just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone over to you. Who's going to call on people? We are? Uh, hey. Uh, this question is for Aspen. Uh, what is your process of ebonizing? Oh, my ebonizing process is that you essentially take some, is this working? Okay, take some steel wool that has no oil on it, or you have to clean steel wool that has oil on it, put it in distilled white vinegar, let it hang out and get to know itself for about 24 hours, and then you put it on wood that has natural tannins in it, and it, not, it turns it black without changing, without actually like obscuring the grain in any way. And if the wood that you're using doesn't have natural tannins, you can put something that has tannins on the wood and let it dry. So there's like tannin teas, or there's black tea, or some people use wine. Use all kind of weird stuff. That's my process. <laughs> Good question. I'll come to you second. This is for Raphael. Hi. Whoa. Um, have you ever gone to Colombia and done any outreach or any working with children there or people? In Not yet. Um, my relationship with Colombia is really, uh, it's tough. I, my mom moved back after 25 years in the States. And so when I go back, it takes so much energy to go back. And my mom and my four aunts want to dominate my time. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't only get to see them every few years. And so it is intensely familial. And um, I, you know, I have, loads and loads of cousins who I've asked, like, hey, do you know somebody who does this, or do you know somebody who does that? And, and I get nothing. And so I, I, I have to be able to spend a significant amount of time to show that I am not just somebody that's there to extract more from them and, um, and, and be able to start working there. And so this is, and it's been the challenge to do um, because uh, my summers are getting invited now to places like this, instead of being able to like say, oh, I'm going to take all three months and go there and try to build community so that I can come back next year and, and do it again. And so I, I, I have to try and find the room for that level of commitment and time uh, so that I could do that. Because yeah, I would love, love to do that. Well, the times that I have gone and, and offered a lecture, um, the, uh, the first question I, ha I receive is, do you have any scholarship money? And my institution, as wealthy as it is, does not. Not for the kinds of things that I do. And so I, I, it's like I, I, I would love to have, you know, help in that way or, or create community and, and relationships in that way. It's like begin a, a kind of an influx. Um, but I don't have, they, they, they are not people of means and, they, and I don't have the money to pay for their schooling. And so I, I, I don't have the way to, hold out hope in that way. Uh, and so it's, 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 it's really, really hard. Um, and uh, I had one game that actually had an image of Pablo Escobar in it uh, that I didn't show today. And a cousin really like called me on the carpet for it. She, says, uh, she thought that that name should not be used and uttered again. Um, and this was long before Narcos, the television series, came out. And so it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, a, we, we can talk more. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be. Oh, it might not. Uh, Hold on. Also, is that what you meant by ebonizing? Was that? Okay. okay. I just want to All right. Sorry. All right <laughs> uh, I could tell that was not the right answer. I'm like, you don't see. What's up? This is for Raphael again. Um, so I wonder if you could maybe speak with a medium that, um, as it's progressed and modernized, it's become 
um, more and more violent video games. Did that have any influence or how has that influenced your creation or your working in that realm? Um, and especially with something that, uh, you know, a lot of your content and concept have traces of violence as well. How, how does that play into your work? Yeah, so, so the first game that we made, Crosser, death was not possible. So there's uh, policy violence, sort of systemic violence built into that depiction. Um, but there, there's no bloodshed. Uh, no, no pixels are harmed in, in Crosser. <laughs> Um, but in, in La Migra, um, there was a bullet, if, if you were paying attention, a very large bullet uh, in the first part of that video. Um, in the rewrite, I have actually removed that bullet, but I had to, part of what was missing from Crosser was the potential, um, the stakes. And so, you know, the, the, the conscious decision to not show any harm in Crosser was itself a critique of the means of expression of commercial off-the-shelf video games. Um, but to be honest about the circumstances on the ground at the U.S.-Mexico border, death had to be a possibility. And so I had to think about um, how death is represented in other video games, and especially in war games. And at the time that I was making La Mira, um, if a non-player character was killed by the player, the carcass would disappear. And the player did not have to think about that death any longer. The, 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 the virtual killing was a goal. Um, in the game La Migra, I didn't show that part in the video uh, for respect of your time. Um, if the, the, the player is capable of killing a non-player character, um, each non-player character has an individuated death drawing to also um, both the strategy of, of war fighting and the sort of concomitant strategy presented by video games that emulate war fighting is to uh, demonize and obliterate any personality in the enemy. And so they are presented as either faceless or all having the same face. And so the the non-player characters in La Migra all are individuated, and their death masks, if you will, are also individuated. Um, further, their cadavers do not disappear and dissolve. In fact, they become impedances for the forward progress of the game. Um, the, if, if you hit a non-player character with your car, your car cannot run over that cadaver it bounces off the cadaver. Um, the gameplay is also written in such a way that if all, if you happen to kill all of the non-player characters, all of their cadavers remain. There is no end screen that shows up, so computer processing continues, and you are stuck in this, and, and you are stuck to deal with and think about what your actions have created. And so, yeah, I, I thought very deeply about um, the depictions of violence and the ones that I would choose to allow to happen. Um, I think of the video games as, let's say, um, I, I've been trying to figure out the language for how to describe this. It's like the crafting of a video game is the crafting of a small moral universe. Every element that is present inside the video game has been handcrafted and hand coded by someone. It has been put there on purpose. In a three-dimensional video game that is representational of our reality, gravity cannot be taken for granted. It has to be written. And so, and so forth with every other decision. And so if one actually sort of thinks that through, then one's like, okay, what will I ask of the player? What will I ask the player to do? What will I allow the player to do? What will my decisions do to reward or impede the player's decisions. And there's, there becomes a sort of underlying structure of ethos that, that is part of the expression. Um, it took a while for me to get there, and so I, you know, it, it, and not all game makers and not all game players get there. Um, and so, I, but it, 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 is, it, it's, it is deeply a part of my practice, and I try to share it with my students. 
was a beautiful question. Thank you. I got two more queued up over here. My question is for Aspen. Hey. You, you began your weaving with a sheep, um, which I just love that. Um, can you talk a little bit about your relationship to trees and to the wood? I am still learning how to have a relationship with trees and wood. I'm not romantic about wood. Like I loved Liesl and I don't, I, I mean, I love trees. I'm, I'm breathing, I love them. But I think that for me, like the, my interest in wood specifically has a lot more to do with the objects that you can make at scale. So the scale of woodworking, the scale of furniture makes sense in wood in a way that it doesn't make sense in clay, it doesn't make sense in metal, not that you can't do it, but it's so inclined towards that particular, like that particular size, which to me is the most intimate connection with a, a body. You know, I mean, all furniture is made in relation to bodies. And so for me, it was, I wanted to make work that was at my scale and that almost stood in for me as a being in space. And that meant wood. And then for me, it was really, at some point, I, I chose wood because I, you know, I was a, working in a lot of different materials and didn't really feel fluent in any of them. And I wanted to have that experience of being able to make what I'm intended to make, having my choices be, in, be like visible. Um, and so I had to get to know something really well. And it was trees. I will say, like, I think that every new thing that I get obsessed with makes my life a little bit more interesting. You know, all of a sudden, I guarantee you that everybody who takes the chair class this week is not going to be able to be normal around a chair for a while. You know, you're, you sit in them, you look at them weird, you flip them upside down. Like, the people in my life have to watch, like, Colin and I do that all the time, and it's terrible for them, but it's fun for us, you know, because the depth of being having just enough information to be more deeply curious about something is one of the most fulfilling experiences that I can that I associate with learning new things. Um, so all of a sudden, I care about furniture in this deep, personal way, and I have started to care about trees that way too since I started working with Windsors. Because you don't start your process at a lumber yard; you start your process in the woods. Um, and you have to choose trees. Like Windsor chairs can't be made out of trees that grow in isolation. So if you have one tree with no trees around it, it's not gonna make a good chair because that tree is gonna be reaching out in all different directions, looking for sun. Um, whereas a tree that grows in a stand of other trees or in community, it's gonna grow straight up and you're gonna be able to use that wood growing in alignment, right? So you have to understand the life cycle of that tree and its relationship to other trees in order to understand what might be inside it, because the commitment to take a tree down is big. So you have to you have to really think about its entire experience since it was born. How long, like, wood is really wild in the beginning, right? It, it shoots, um, shoots off branches everywhere trying to get resources and access to resources, and then as it ages, it isolates certain branches and will choose them and keep them and let others get sort of absorbed by the trunk. And so if a tree is in its wild phase for too long, then the inside of it isn't gonna be very useful. Like there'll be this huge core that I can't use for chair making. So you have to find trees that like figured themselves out quickly. Like there's all of these things, you know, that you have to look for. Um, and you're also looking for wood that grows really fast, weirdly, because you want um, the summer wood. The summer wood is stronger. Anyway, this is getting super dweeby. <laughs> But yeah, I have started really thinking. It changes the way that I walk around places. And now that I travel and teach, and I just traveled to Australia to teach chair making, and I'm going to be going to Japan soon. And it's one of those things like, I didn't know the woods at all, the, the, the materials that I could use for chair making in Australia. And I had to learn them quickly, because you use different materials, different woods for each of the um, elements of the chair. So you use a soft wood for the seat, you use interlocked hardwoods for the legs, and you use open-grained hardwoods for the spindles in the back. Yeah, so you have to find it. And they're like, will Australian blackwood work? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and they're like, figure it out. Anyway, sorry, long-winded answer. So I've been trying to play around with something that has me thinking about how you two are linked. So in um, childhood development, they talk about the distinction between play, game, and sport. And so play is 
there are either no rules or you, the, the kids make up the rules. So like you see four-year-olds and they run up to each other and they say, hey, you wanna play? And then they run around and you have no, like, no idea what they're doing. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you have sport, which is there's rules, but the people participating enforce the rules. I'm sorry, game is there are rules, but you, you enforce the rules. And then sport is you have rules and there's an external party who enforces it. Mm -hmm. And that classification, like to me, doesn't make sense after listening to you. Because like part of what you're doing is disrupting the rules, right? And you're disrupting the external party who enforces the rules. Mm -hmm. And so and, and so you, you talk about doing games, you talk about doing play, mm -hmm. and there's something here that's really kind of magical that I haven't figured out, but I just wanted to kind of say it to see what sparks might fly, because there's something very playful, but your playfulness depends upon there actually being rules, mm -hmm. right? In yeah. any, so. Yeah. This is gonna keep me up tonight. Well, I'm holding the mic and I can <laughs> answer that somewhat quickly, at least um, on a superficial level and say that I love playing with things, but I like rules as well. And I think that's why I like furniture and why I like working with material. Because at least for me, given all the choices in the world, I become far less creative. I like shut down. And for me, I need to, I need to be told that something is a certain way so that I can push back against it. Like I play more I, I play much more bravely in a fenced area. So like for me, understanding that furniture has rules, I bounce up against them and I push them around, but I understand the framework. And so for me, that creates the most space for me to play. And when I say play, I'm really talking about engaging with, like, so that Carl Jung quote about you know, the creative mind plays with what it loves and everything new emerges from the play instinct. It's almost easier to understand that quote in, in, in reverse in that logical thinking will pretty much just create new things based on previous things, right? And that in order to create something genuinely new, you have to engage with your own like celestial internal landscape of, of hot nonsense that you've, you know, accumulated over your entire lifetime. And so like to allow, um, like a fluent skill set to then mingle with play and all of the all of the like you know subconscious things that have led to whatever however it is that I play like that is where I, that's where my best work comes from it's like a weird combination of fluency control and chaos that's very personal chaos yeah and I harmonize very much with that um, the, yeah, it, it, one of the things that we tell novices who are learning how to make games is, and, and oftentimes parents, because parents don't have quite the vocabulary of, of developmental um, associations with play that, that you've brought forward, that uh, parents believe that games are somehow not constrained by rules, but um, games are actually rule-based systems, and they're only made manifest through the interaction of, with the rule set, which is play. Um, and so I, and, and I, you know, we, we started making games out of playfulness, out of the sort of, yeah, play, playful, um, poking fun at games and at our own selves and at the situation we were in. And um, I, I am freest when I sit down and try to noodle through something, which is another aspect of play as just trying to find the shapes and find the ideas. Um, and um, I have a, a colleague who offered me another really useful bit of language when we were providing um, novice learners with parameters, which is another rule set, um, rather than offering them a, a, a blank canvas. Um, we were providing traction, and you yourself were thinking about the, the rules as something to push against. Traction. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's like, we, it's a, we, to be able to gain purchase into the possibility space of our ideas, uh, a, a grain of sand in the works can help us out to get, get the traction that we need to get going, uh, rather than sort of flail around. And so, it, and so, and, and that can, you know, in that sense, it's like we're being playful with some students' expectations, and then we might need to provide that own, uh, we might have to artificially constrain ourselves so that we can provide ourselves with the, the traction. So as a sort of a grown-up artist, 
Um, and it's like, okay, I, I will make a mistake on purpose so that I can react to the mistake rather than have this blank screen <laughs> that's just gonna stare back at me and, and laugh at me. So. Hello, this question's for Aspen. I'm gonna try to be concise and not overshare, both of which I'm probably gonna fail at, but here's to <laughs> trying. Um, uh, so I kind of come from a background of not really being versed in any way or familiar with in any way, um, like working with my hands, and it's only in the last year that I've really um, made a concerted effort to change that because I kind of got to a breaking point with myself where I got mm -hmm. just really tired of feeling like I didn't know how to do anything, like mm -hmm. anything practical, anything useful. Um, so I'm 28 now, and I started woodworking last year when I was 27, and that's definitely bred a lot of like insecurity for me about being like, am I just kidding myself? Like, did I like miss the boat kind of? Or like, especially coming from, you know, I was a ballet dancer growing up, but it just feels like totally antithetical to this world that I'm trying to, uh, I guess, find entry into. Mm -hmm. um, or, um, and I'm just curious if you experienced that at all, or like, I know that's like mm -hmm. probably a difficult, it's not really a question, it's more like if you have wisdom or if that was an experience that you shared or, yeah, because this is definitely something that I've, I'm really passionate about and haven't mm -hmm. been passionate about something in a really long time. Um, but I can't help but running into this like feeling of like insecurity or of yeah. like of like totally like feeling like I'm kidding myself and being able to make it into a life, you know. Totally. Yeah. Um, okay. Three three quick things about that. Like one, um, it took me forever to start doing what I'm doing now for a number of reasons. Like one of my favorite artifacts of my childhood is, you know, those um, pieces of paper that you're given that have like a little area to draw and then little area to write. And this one had a prompt that said, when I grow up, I want to be. And then, and mine had an artist, but I, they don't make any money, so I'll be a lawyer. And there was the drawing was of a, like a paintbrush with a giant X across it. And then a crying face holding a briefcase. <laughs> And I still have it. It's in my studio. You know, so it like took a long time to get over, you know, because I didn't grow up in a, in a family where um, like having an insecure financial future was like, was, e was even something I was allowed to consider. You know, there was no space for it. Um, and then there's also like just the, in not um, like direct bigotry, but just the internalized misogyny of our culture that just assumes that you're not interested. And then it's really easy to internalize that and also assume that you're not interested and just channel your creativity towards something else, you know? And or so feeling then, like unwelcome, like feeling like, oh, I'm just pretending. Like yeah, I don't yeah, belong. totally. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then that last piece about being like ashamed, embarrassed, or whatever, like constantly, except that I remember so consciously not knowing something and then knowing it. And I wasn't any stupider before I knew it, I just didn't know it yet. And so like constantly seeing myself as like, and being kind to the versions of myself that didn't know the things that I know now, allow me to be kind to myself now as I don't know the things that I want to know. And so it's like a continuum. And then choosing to be embarrassed is something that I do every day. Like I choose to be, it's humiliating to make work. It's hard and you're bad at it and you make mistakes that you shouldn't make or whatever, it's, it's hard. And it, it's very vulnerable and it feels really weird. And like having to come forward and ask questions that I don't, I remember having to ask how to use a drill when I was 31. That's when I learned how to use a drill. You know, and like the people in that room and whatever they happened to think of me, they were just part of my journey towards the, you know, the next day when I did know how to use a drill. And so it's like constantly respect for my previous self that very recently didn't know how to do, choose any given thing. You know, and then understanding that that self is just another version of the person that I am now, and that I deserve to know the thing that I want to know. Like, I deserve to know that, and so I will figure it out. And whoever has to watch me not know it, then that's cute, that's fine. <laughs> you know, and that's okay. And if, like, if they can't handle understanding that they're watching an evolving person figure out how they want to interact with the world, and if they're seeing me as some static creature that doesn't now know how to use a drill and therefore will never know how to use a drill, then that person doesn't have the capacity to imagine the future that I am hoping to live, and therefore they're not gonna be there with me anyway. So it's like this is one of those short-term relationships 
that is, yeah, just let it pass, I guess. Yeah, but the, the experience of embarrassment is just, I feel like it's a really healthy part of it. And I just like looking at myself and being like, look at you, <laughs> being bad at that. <laughs> Hopefully not for very much longer. You know, yeah, it's like a, ni it's a nice feeling. It can be. Yeah. And did you have sort of like as you were pursuing this avenue, though, I'm, I'm assuming that maybe there were other things you had to do kind of simultaneously to fund or fuel your kind of pursuit of woodworking? Or mm -hmm. were you kind of always able to be working in a shop or a sort of no. curious the more practical nature of like how you eventually yeah. got to making it your, yeah. your main main kind of. Uh, I was a high school teacher for seven years. Um, yeah, <laughs> and it was the best job I ever had and I loved it so, so much and it was absolutely my intention to do it forever and the only reason why I engaged with furniture at all was because I felt like I was 29 and lucky enough to be doing a job I could imagine doing for the rest of my life and I was like, what if I just took a hot break and did something I've always wanted to do that I could always, I just couldn't imagine regretting learning how to make furniture, you know, however that ended up manifesting in my future. And also I was just young enough and just dumb enough that I had the energy to do it and like not the insight to understand how dangerous it really was. And so it sounds like maybe you're in the same position. Um, yeah. And then I like I worked at um, a craft school called Penland for two years. Like I ran their wood shop for two years. Um, I've like really blended my love of teaching and my love of making in all aspects of my practice. Yeah, let it all in. Like it's all relevant. Like all of the skill sets that you've already developed are all relevant to the future that you're going to have in wood. And so you're not starting over. It's just like a continuum. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I hate to do this because it's such a great conversation, but I think we should wrap it up. Uh, a lot of people have had long days of travel, including these two. So um, we'll meet back here at 845 tomorrow for orientation. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>